Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, this is it. We're live. Hey, Varun, what is going on, my friend? How are you? I'm very good. I'm looking outside my windows, bright and sunny. Wonderful day to be alive. Certainly, yeah. certainly. I am right with you. We've had a few days of rain here, so I'm excited. All right, I'm excited for today's guest. Are we ready for an intro? We Today's guest is a technology and business leader, an entrepreneur, a technical consultant, formerly a technical consultant at WeWork, a, was a senior software engineer at Toptail, founder and chief, uh, chief product development at CoBuild Lab, Angel Lacrette. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, I'm, uh, I'm doing really good. As you can see, the sun, right? Right there. There you go. <laughs> In the back. <laughs> Uh, well, it's actually a pretty hot day in Miami. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope you're, you're, you're really good too. All right, Angel. We're going to start off with our favorite question about myth, myth busting, myth smashing, myth eradicating. You know, what is one myth that you'd like to smash? You know, it can be about anything, a bogus strategy, misconception, something that you want to set the record straight on. What, what do you got cooking over there? What do you want to um, clear up? Well, uh, yeah, I'd like to speak about a little bit about the ecosystem for agencies and service providers here in Miami, right? Mm -hmm. Usually uh, people refer to Miami as a vacation city, right? Well, you have the beach, you have the parties, but you have more than that. So there's more to do in Miami than just go to the <laughs> beach or visit you know, yeah, I believe that. Or yeah, check yeah. out cool art. <laughs> or check out cool art. <laughs> or eat. Uh, funny that our main office right now is located at the Winwood District. It's kind of like the epicenter of art here in Miami. But again, we, we do more stuff. We don't only go to the beach and party and look at, at art. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, and it's funny you say that because the last vacation I went on to Miami, that's all I did. <laughs> <laughs> I happened to be there during Art Basel. Uh, Basil? Base, yeah, our basil. Yeah. Base, that's how you say it, right? Yeah, our, basil. our basil. Yeah, it was like we didn't know we were booking it. We showed up. It was really uh, like super cool. And I know that's what the myth you want to smash over here, but I did enjoy myself quite a bit. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, talking a little bit about that, and especially kind of like the last six to eight months, uh, there is kind of like a big trend. If you can find it on on, Twi on Twitter, is uh, hashtag Miami Tech. Uh, where everybody's like spotting uh, founders and VCs and, you know, different elements for the entrepreneurial ecosystem that are like moving from big cities to, to well, bigger cities in terms of tech to, to Miami and, you know, the whereabouts. And here why is that? Why, why is that trend changing? Well, I believe that uh, now that, that we face COVID and the most of these big companies, they, they are allowing like remote work. Uh, people are like moving from those uh, expensive cities to, you know, more affordable places, right? And Florida, South Florida has always been like a location for moving or moving to, you know, just, I guess the weather, you know, uh, the, the beach too, that's, that's something very interesting there, like the art. Uh, the lifestyle and you know we we have been receiving like for for a few months already like a lot of a lot of you know big players in the tech space like who has moved down there give us a little you know for those um, of us not following the hashtag yeah. yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah we we have been spotting like companies like microsoft apple like opening offices here uh you know around the downtown area and the midtown area yeah um, that's cool and just those are the ones that are like the really big ones we have a lot of small ones too that are like opening offices here so yeah. with with your expertise you know coming from a place like we work and you know the the idea of co-working is that something that you guys 
you know, I know as we were prepping for this episode, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be transparent for a minute. You know, I, you have a really <laughs> active space every call that we've had with you, which is kind of fun and cool. And, you know, we're a little bit, a little bit jealous of that. You know, is that something <laughs> that you guys employ at CoBuild? Is that something that, you know, your personal experience with co-working, would love to hear a little bit more about some of, some of your journey with that experience in particular, because with COVID, that's one of the big things that's affected, even in our conversations during recording, you know, chatting with people, is like, how do you keep the culture? How do you keep people connected? And, you know, I'd love to hear some of your, your perspective on that. Yeah, well, it's got, that's kind of like a tricky question, right? Um, you you may know this, uh, but before COVID hit and uh, we were was like involved in a couple of financial problems there. They used to they used to have like five offices here around the Miami area, and they were planning to open a couple of additional buildings. So the co work the co work here is kind of like a big thing, right? I think in general, co working for uh, the entrepreneurial community is like really important, right? Um, I think that something that stands even after the COVID problem is that, you know, being an entrepreneur requires like a lot of networking and in-person networking is like super important there, right? It's not the same attending to events online than, uh, than actually like, shaking hands and, you know, meeting people face to face, right? Um, in the second part of your question, well, for us as a company, we have always been remote first. So since I started a company around five years ago, uh, we have been having like staff outside of the country, you know, in different parts of Latin America, uh, Mexico. We have worked with people in Spain and we also have customers in Europe and, you know, in different other cities in the United States. So kind of like the culture of remote for us has been, has been like always there. I think that this has been a boom for us too, right? Because now the, the hardest part about being remote is how you, uh, warm clients, right? How you communicate trust and how you present yourself as a serious company, right? And I think that uh, kind of got a little bit like the COVID thing improved that just because now people can take you like more seriously, even if you, they see you through a, through a screen, just because that's how business is conducted, you know, right now. Even, even interviews for big companies are now like remote and, you know, following on, on that train about you know, now people can move to more affordable places or weathers where they feel more comfortable with, uh, you know, working for a big remote company. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that you have been remote for quite some time, even before you started this company, you worked with WeWork, you worked with TopTill and TopTill as many of the agencies might know they are recruiting company, right? They, they help you find resources, developers, and you worked in that company that must have given you some experience on hiring and managing devs. But, um, and as you started your company, the remote first was always the idea as I'm hearing from you, um, what, were some of the challenges, if any, when you started? I mean, you know, yes, right now everybody is forced to go remote, but when you have an option, agencies usually would like to keep people close to each other because of, you know, proximity. They want to work and see each other every day. They want to build a culture and everything. But when you started the company, what was the driving force for you um, and, what were some of those challenges that you faced in the beginning before your processes were matured enough? Yeah, that's, that's kind of like a really good question. It was indeed a challenge, right? Um, like developers for some time that are, they're having used to work remotely since 15, 20 years ago, since the internet was like good enough to have like video calls and stuff like that. Uh, but the rest of the company, like, you know, like, you know, the marketing department, the sales department, even some people from the project, uh, you know, areas and even some developers, they, they have, you know, big challenges working. I wouldn't say like, like the appropriate term is it will be like working remotely, 
the it's mostly like the isolation right the the you know being alone in your in your house and try to figure out how to solve problems and and try to get things done uh that's that will say like is the biggest challenge ever right uh for us to be able to overcome that we have to like you know as you were saying like become you know more like a process company you know the at some point you realize that nothing's or some things are not like, you know, one, one, one comment away or one hand away. Some things they need to put like a process and workflows to be able to make them available for everybody who needs them, right? So I will say like the incorporation of those workflows, defining pretty well who is doing what at what point and where things are, are like one of the pillars of, of being able to have like a normal remote culture, right? Also the tooling, right? We use we use multiple project management tools for different areas. Even if, if it is a little bit redundant, uh, you know, the project area behaves different than marketing. Marketing behaves different than sales. So everybody has like the, their own like platform and tool that they use for communicate, right? So picking the right tools, that's also kind of like the second thing that I will say that is, is super important to be able to be successful in this remote culture. Yeah. So if, if I am an agency, you know, a small start, or if I'm starting to build or create a new agency and want to start going remote, right? What would be, you know, some of the basic most important tips that you would give me to start even thinking about it? Like, I want to go remote. I don't want to, like, I live in, you know, Metro, like a bigger city like New York or Boston. Um, I'm not able to, I don't want to hire expensive resources. So I want to go out. I want to go remote other parts of the country or even you, you have experience in hiring people in South America, in Spain, in Europe, in other parts of the world. I mean, it's not easy to find people just anywhere. How you recruit, how do you make sure he's the right fit? Are there any tips, anything you can share that helped you succeed in finding and hiring the right people? when they are not real in front of you, you know? Yeah, talking about recruiting, that's kind of like a big, big deal too, right? Um, I'm not like a people's person, right? I hire, I've hired developers that I literally never even hear their voices. I just talk to them via chat, via an email. We schedule like a test that they need to do. They deliver the test and I just check out the results and how they work. And if I feel that, they're like good fit for the company. I just hire them and make them, you know, go on board into, we, we use a Slack for internal communication. So I just make them like an, a soft onboarding process on, on Slack, right? For people in different areas like marketing and sales my, sales, my sales department is actually local, right? For the salespeople, I require it for them to have like an in-person interview just because I guess I'm not like so, um, I don't have so many experience dealing with salespeople. So I just wanted to try to make the, the best possible effort to make like the right choice, right? Uh, with the marketing team was similar. Um, I, I did, I did kind of like video, video call interviews, uh, phone calls. Um, there are actually a couple of templates that are online that we use for assess like personality where they use like different weird questions like, you know, how do you organize your closet or how do you organize your like, the clothing? Do you have any specifics uh, way of doing that? Or there is like this funny question that I used to do in all the interviews for the marketing people like, um, you know, we, we sometimes want to bring people to the office that we have here. Um, and kind of like once a month, we want to set those guys, you know, just attending the front door, right? Just sitting there, they're gonna be the ones who are gonna open the door for someone who's coming in or open the door for someone's come back. So there, those type of questions just reveal a little bit about personality, just because you want, what, what you want to figure out there if you, if you and that person make like a good team in terms of communication, right? Because that's gonna be like something paramount uh, during a remote relationship. And of course, there's a trial, the, the traditional trial and error like I've done a lot of trial and error. I really, I really like to give the opportunity and provide like the means for people to work in their, in their desired environment and with the desired tools and with the desired processes. But definitely, I mean, in that trial and error, we have had a lot of bad experiences 
with people who just don't want to collaborate. They are doing something else just because they're not like used to the remote life. They just cannot like uh, work well with others. They don't, they don't uh, like adjust to the processes of the company. And we, we just want, we just need to like then go and, you know, try to find some other that fits, right? So yeah. I would say like one of the key things hard in there is like personality, at least for those type of positions. And in the engineering technical space, you know, it's just because I'm a developer uh, and I have a lot of experience developing software. So for me, it doesn't matter if someone can speak or someone can collaborate with the other ones. As long as it's good, we, we will figure out just because in terms of processes, the software development is a little bit more mature in that remote culture, right? Uh, you have big, big systems like, uh, for example, like the Linux kernel, if you know a little bit about that, that's been developed by a thousand, thousand people all over the world and they don't meet, right? They have like specific workflows when they do something and then someone else kicks in and, you know, they, they just make it work. So, so I, I, um, um, I'll ask one more question, Jesse, before no, I- No, go, you you're good, keep going. Um, <laughs> no, I, this is in, interesting. I understand, I totally get what you're saying when you're hiring a dev, you don't really need to, you know, as long as they are, they can write good code, they are technically savvy, they, you, you're good to hire them. As an agency owner, what I feel, what we have seen, we have experienced is writing a good code is not always enough. When you are dealing with the customers, you need people who can coordinate the efforts as well, right? Um, if your developer is not, you know, good with communication, he's good with, you know, doing his job, which is writing code, there has to be somebody who can connect with the end client, communicate, understand their requirements, like a business analyst person or somebody who can lead the efforts to make sure what is being communicated is clear and crisp. Um, how do you fill that gap uh, right now? Meaning um, it, when you go hire devs, clearly you said that you look mostly for technical skills, but do you go and hiring people locally or you also you know, have people offshore who does the uh, management piece as well? Uh, that's, that's actually a really good question. Um... As before COVID, like, and just let me let me uh, put that a little bit. We filled that gap there with two different positions. Uh, we have a project manager who uh, coordinate resources within you know a team, and then we have an account manager who is more like a contract level type of communication with the client, right? Uh, before COVID, uh, those two roles were done like always locally. Right. We always like like local people here who can interface with customers just because that's what they they want. Right. And that's kind of like one of the values that we that we were providing as an agency. Right. We give you like an affordable model. Right. For you to do development, software development. Keep in mind that the resources are being hired, you know, outside of the country, but you have someone in, the, in between. So you don't have to deal like with remote communication, video calls, daily standups and all that, right? When COVID hit, you know, everybody went remote, right? And now we have incorporated a couple of project managers that are like fully remote outside of the country, right? Uh, they're very, very good with people. They have very good people skills. They're very fluent in English. They are in the same time zone. And, and I guess that that culture has stick. And for, for now, it's kind of like working for us. I have a couple of questions around how you make this work so successfully. If we can, if we can get into like the tactics for a quick second, <laughs> you know, I love your, the, the explanation of the interview too, because as a marketer myself, the creative questions are so much fun to ask. You know, my favorite is what's your dream job. And I don't really care what you're going to answer me with your real life dream job. If you're interviewing marketers, they're usually going to say, I want to be CMO. I want to be a COO, you know, some of that. I want to hear like pie in the sky, no money was no object. What's the answer? Because that's the, like you said, tells a lot about their personality. And my favorite answer I've ever gotten to that question 
<laughs> was a front man for a hair metal band. <laughs> <laughs> this, and the guy who answered it was a, a copywriter. He was, it was like such a weird, I was like, oh my God, you would never have known from his personality. So it's a fun, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. You had talked a lot about tools a minute ago around, you know, as a global team, let's say, because you are a global team now, you know, currently. And each of the departments use different softwares to be able to manage workloads. Are there some specifics that you can share in terms of how you've been able to do that successfully? You know, that's one of the struggles that I see. There's so many pieces of tech out there, so many ways to kind of solve these issues in terms of cross country communication and how the work gets managed, you know, outside of everyone asking who, you know, who is in that role. What tools have you found that your team uses globally to, to kind of make that work? Any sure, of course. Um, I will start with the technical part, with the engineering part. We use for coding and, and tracking tasks, we use, we use GitHub mm -hmm. from uh, Microsoft. That's a very global tool, very known tool between developers. Certainly. Uh, that's code hosting and, and you know, uh, task management, you know, project mm -hmm. management. That's what we use in that area. Uh, we use a couple of additional tools or call like body for uh, there is this process within software development that is called continuous integration and continuous development. Mm -hmm. That is basically to narrow the bridge between someone doing something or coding something and actually uh, someone using that piece of code and, or that piece of functionality. Uh, we use Slack. That's kind of mm -hmm. like our cornerstone for communication. That's like it's what everyone's doing. doing. We all yeah. should have bought Slack stock before COVID <laughs> is what we should have done. <laughs> yeah, so every every communication is going there. Of course, we use G Suite for emailing. Um, uh, Are there PM softwares that you use that you know that you found to be successful across globally? You know, like a, for what PM softwares, project management software, or work management, or. Yeah, for for uh, for project management, we use GitHub. It has like its own project uh, piece of software, but we always uh, complement that with a higher level piece. For that, mm -hmm. we use Asana. Gotcha. Right? It's more like a, you know yeah. like a client level, account level type of project management. Just because you want to not you want to see that Gantt chart with percentages, just because that's what people. Your so non-technical like. level of PM. It's yeah, for, they provide the executive summary. Right for for the marketing team, we use Trello. Uh, oh, we use Kanban boards and Trello for different uh, for different processes and activities. They have like their own structure there. Uh, for for an executive management of the company, we also use Trello mm -hmm. uh, for like executive tasks and things that we need to do for for moving the company forward. Um, let me see what else. Oh, for for the salespeople, we use a CRM that's called Odoo. Uh, there is an open, it's an open source CRM for there to, to track sales and leads and all that stuff. Cool. And we use the same, the same product for, uh, you know, for recruitment and HR. All right. Um, so you've got a pretty good traditional suite of stuff in there. Yeah. For accounting and invoicing, we use one called Wave. Yep. That's also, that's also kind of like pretty cool. Uh, tool and I think that's that's pretty much it. I'm sure that there's a lot a lot more. I no, guess, that's uh, good. I just was curious. I'm, <laughs> I'm you know in terms of folks listening, what might be useful to how point people in direction. You know, with sure. a global team as well, how do you guys manage the time difference? Well, actually, we don't have time that many time difference. Um, we have like only like a couple of hours. Uh, honestly, I just set up the meeting or I get invited to a meeting and I just ask for not to have any meetings before 9 a.m. just because I like to organize my day or take a couple of hours for organizing my day. I know there's some people jumping those those 9 a.m. and they have like 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. their time zone. I think it's just a matter of, you know, listening if they are okay with it. And sometimes we just need to move like a meeting like an hour or a couple of hours especially the ones that are like in daily basis mm -hmm. just to make everybody feels comfortable with, uh, with customers. We have, we have had customers in the Pacific area, you know, a uh, few hours difference. Uh, sometimes we have meetings, you know, 8 PM or 9 PM. And right now we're dealing with a big 
with a big lead that is in Australia. And yeah, all the meetings that we have with them are 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. So I will I kind of like to say that for me, it's a little bit transparent. I think it affects a little bit more my wife are the ones that are getting, <laughs> they're getting a little bit affected. I know that as a leader of the company, I, I, I think that executive staff, if they are uncomfortable with a time zone, they probably are not, are not like, you know, so open to communicate that just because, uh, you know, one of the things that I do is like every couple of weeks, I try to do, to do like a pep talk, right? Mm -hmm. We are a growing company. We need to put more effort than anywhere else. Uh, you know, just because we want to keep growing, right? For the last few years, we have been growing. And in order for us to keep growing, we need to put the extra mile. So I always like to use that, that speech and that maybe creates like a, some sort of like a, like a barrier there for people telling me like, no, I cannot do this or no, I cannot do it at this time. So, so I, I guess we're good, you know? Uh, that doesn't affect us that much. Uh, and I think that we, have, we have to make it work. Yeah, yeah. What would you say, you know, as an agency owner is the biggest challenge that you're facing right now? Or, you know, what's that one thing that keeps you up at night? Oh my God. I have so many things. <laughs> I will say, Give us a couple. Yeah, I would say like <laughs> the top, the top uh, item that keeps me away is growing the company. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, getting bigger contracts, getting more clients, uh, make sure that we are healthy in the sense that we have like a, a same pipeline or a predictable pipeline of, you know, new business coming through through the door. So is your goal then, and maybe I should have asked this one first too, your goal then as an agency, you know, it's interesting. We've talked to a few different, a few, quite a few different agencies and everyone has a different plan for what their five years looks like, you know? some people are happy at the size that they are and their goal is to maintain some people are looking to make a left turn you know would you say that you know based off of what keeps you up at night your your goal is from a growth perspective you guys would like to grow and expand and you know future plans i guess is where my that's where my rambling question is headed what are your future plans at your agency <laughs> right so we were planning uh we were planning for this in the next year to grow in a 8x at least in terms of revenue. Uh, I think that that's very achievable given the stage that we are. Uh, I think that a five-year plan will be, yeah, probably get an exit from the company or get acquired. Um, I think that that will help, that will happen earlier. Probably five years from now, hopefully I'm retired or maybe just a part-time worker in something that I really like. Um, you know, maybe I like a software products or something similar. Hope, I hope that, that that will be the case. So, um, Varun, got any more questions here? Otherwise, I'm going to shift gears a little bit for a few minutes. Go for it. All right. So, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit. You've had a, a fun journey in terms of getting to where you're running this agency. You know, you started off your career as an engineer, as we talked a little bit about. You know, coming from Venezuela to Miami you went can you tell us a little bit about you know why Miami out of all the places in the states to kind of settle is there right. a particular um, reason yeah um uh well one of the key reasons why I moved to Miami is because I, I I've been here before I move I was here like a couple of times and I really love the city I love the landscape uh you know, believe it or not, it looks a lot like home uh, in terms of, you know, that big landscape, big houses, uh, you know, big streets, enough space. The weather is similar to. So it kind of like felt, uh, you know, like the right move for me. Right. I already knew a bunch of people here. Yeah. Uh, before I decided to move, I was already coming here like every six months, you know, to network and know the ecosystem. Uh, probably like six years ago, it was like completely different ecosystem in terms of technology and entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, everybody was complaining. Everybody was was doing like tech events and everybody was complaining like everybody comes to Miami to party or going to the beach and no one comes to work, right? Uh, but still, I think I saw that as, as an opportunity, right? 
um, just because tech was all, all over all over the world at that moment already. And I think that the fact that it wasn't it wasn't like so many competitors or so many people doing and trying to do the same thing that I was trying to do, it felt it felt like an opportunity for me to take, right? Yeah. Um, at that moment, I was already a business owner. I was like a very immature business owner. Uh, believe me, it has been hard for me. Even even nowadays, I struggle with, you know, I just want to sit down and code and help this guy build this thing with versus, no, I need to go and put like a good shirt and make like a good presentation for a client or trying to get a deal from it. I still struggle with, struggle with that. I, that's not like my comfort zone, but I, I've been... I've been doing it, you know, I managed to do it. I've, I've been hiring people for taking that work for me now. And I think that this is going to be a, a breakthrough year for us. It's going to be like a, uh, like a very big change in terms of someone better than me running the company or at least, you know, managing the, the big accounts. And then me taking a step back in that area and just, you know, work where I feel more comfortable with that is, engineering and coding so how do you how do you i mean that is a struggle for a lot of of agency owners you know a lot of us started our agencies because we're experts in a certain function and then it just organically grows from there how do you you know and sales doesn't always come naturally to people how do, how do you deal with that what are some techniques that you've learned to be able to kind of any tips that you can share for our listening audience around how to kind of sure, overcome some sure. of that? I, I got to admit that that has been like the most challenging part for me. And yeah. I also have to admit that when I started, I make a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. I, I'm definitely not a, 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 a normal or I would say like a natural sell, salespeople or salesperson. You're in good company with a lot of folks in your role. So don't, you know, you know, yeah, I'm, getting I'm, on and chatting with us is great. I always been like terrible, right? <laughs> and when I go to a presentation, what I'm trying to do, what I figure out how to fix that problem is to be honest, right? Uh, and try to be as blunt as possible, right? People, when dealing with small agencies, they recognize that you're not a salesperson, right? They recognize that if you're, if they are reaching out to you because you know you have a lot of experience of marketing, they're not gonna find a person who you know manages a multi-million dollar company or has those skills. They're gonna find someone who does the work and knows a lot about the work and dominates the subject, and that's what they want to see. I, I think the people who go to those type of places and the ones that they don't, they just are like misplaces a little bit, right? Do you feel like your transparency and your vulnerability here kind of closes, helps you close the deals in a lot of ways is what I'm hearing. I mean, I, I certainly use it. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. Why not? So. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I've been always like blunt. There, there are a lot of people, I think the most of our current customers, they like to hear you, even if they don't understand, right? They like to hear you that you you're dominate whatever they're trying to do, right? They, they want to feel secure when they delegate something. They want to feel that even they, if, they, if they're making an effort into paying your services, it's in good hand, it's been taken care of, right? Um, I think that a second, a second good thing that I've done in that space that have been working for me is like provide like a really good customer service, right? Uh, many, many, and many, many clients I, I've lost money just because I want to give like a really good impression and I want them to feel like satisfied with working with me. Sometimes that plays good. Sometimes that plays really bad because, you know, whenever you're going to do something else, you realize that you need more money and you need more resources to be able to pull that something. Yeah. Say like, hey, what's this? You know, it's not the, the same time. As Can't we call the client back. Excuse me. I need another 10 grand to build the thing that you wanted because I lied to you in the beginning. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had that a lot. Right. More than I wanted to admit. Right. It's hard. It's a hard. It's like a rock and a hard place in a lot of ways. Yeah. But it's really hard. Um, I've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts, you know, about how to deal with the situations where you're a provider. I also read a couple of books about selling. And uh, also a lot, of, a lot of articles about value pricing, right? Sometimes people hangs into 
you know, charging like a, a lower fee just because you're starting or just because mm -hmm. you're a small agency and you want to get the client because you just need the cash flow. Uh, but sometimes it's better to start like, you know, charging like a good fee where you feel that you can give like 100% of yourself into achieving something and get that customer satisfaction that everybody wants to provide, right? I think that that's, that's going to be, that has to be your focus. It is hard, you know, I took like the long path to, to get there. So, uh, what I usually was doing is like charging low prices. And then when I knew what I was able to do, what I knew what it, it was being required for me to do something, then I would start like increasing the prices just little by little, you know, getting more customers in that price range, then skipping to the next price range. And that's, that's kind of like has been the last four to five years. That's so awesome. I mean, you brought up a very interesting point about value pricing because this does come up a lot. So you are saying now you are in a position where you do uh, use value pricing more than selling a cheaper service. Is that what your, your current model is? Yeah, for, I will say like we started this maybe like six to eight months ago. And then I'm telling you that the company has like already five years. Yeah. So it was like pretty recent just because I know that people wants to feel more taken care of. And in order to do that, we just need to provide more value and more value means like more time from us. Right. Do, do you see that as a threat or a competition? Because many, many companies in the world, especially agencies or companies who have global teams, not everybody understand the idea of value pricing. Right. And they usually go for a cheaper rate and it's a race to the bottom. So how do you deal with that? Do you, well, would, first of all, you know, turning down the client is not easy, right? Um, are you doing that a lot now? Because with, with value pricing, I'm pretty sure customers would say no if you ask for a ridiculous amount of money for a very small thing because you want to charge value or you are giving the value to them do you come across such situations yeah um i think that as i was saying for this last eight months we have been i guess maybe for the first time in in our five years we have been turning down customers just because we just realized that we cannot grow the company where we want it to be you know keeping that bottom of the, of the price type of strategy, right? Yeah. Uh, for us as a, as a consultants, uh, that just doesn't, doesn't work and it doesn't scale, right? That, that fits some certain uh, models. Like if you have like a small agency or a small company where you're like one, two or three, maybe it fits in some, in some, in some initial parts of your journey but then you just have to like change the model, right? Once you start like getting uh, experience, when you start getting like reviews, when you know that your work is good and that's what you want to do and grow, then you have to switch to a, to a, a better model, right? And one of the things that we, we have done is we have, to, we have diverse, diversify like our, our clientele, right? We used to be dedicated, dedicated full to entrepreneurs. And what we did with, now we have like 50% entrepreneurs and 50% like the small businesses and company, right? And usually for companies, it is a little bit better understood the fact that we're going to take care of everything, right? We're going to be doing this job for you. And this has a value that we have already stipulated. Just, to, just it will be a matter if it makes sense for your business model, if it doesn't make sense for your business model to plug us in and do all the work, right? But definitely, yeah. I mean, definitely we have been turning down customers just because we are not, we stopped being fit for certain type of scenarios. Yeah. Do you have, when you turn them down, do you refer them out to other people? Like, do you have a network, you know, say, sorry, um, we're not a fit? Or are you like, but go talk to so-and-so? Yeah, I've known over, over my career, I know a lot of freelancers that I have on my, on my like community groups and chats and group chats and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not like a big referral, <laughs> a, ver a big source of referrals. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've done that in the past, like especially like websites, for example, like we're, we're not like cut it or fit for building websites just because we're, we have like our processes more 
fit to systems and applications. So usually it's very expensive for us to build a website. So we just normally I'd say like, hey, you should do like a freelancer. You can talk with this guy. Uh, they probably give you a better price fitted for your use case and you will just save money and you know that's that's good enough for you cool well this was a very interesting conversation today and hell thank you so much for your time um i want to go through the list of where people can find you they can find you on linkedin the twitter um at cobuildlab.com right is there any other location where they, where folks, if they want to kind of connect with you, those are the three big ones though, usually that folks have. Oh yeah, so. for, for developers, um, my handle is at A-L-A-C-R-E-T, like in Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, GitHub too. It's a good source for now oh, good. social uh, encounters for developers. Uh, but yeah, definitely. I will refer you to cobuildlab.com. That's the company. That's what I want to push. And <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, you know, for folks listening. If you learned something today, please share, share the podcast. And thanks everyone. Thanks, Varun. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.